Uh, all right, so yeah, uh, in the second day of uh, course, uh, we, will <laughs> we will talk about inferential statistics. Um, so we will start by installing the packages and then some uh, basic <laughs> concept of inferential statistics and then experimental design and power analysis. So to install packages in R is very simple. You can just use the, the function install.packages and then include the name of the package within quotation marks or uh, you can use uh, um, the, the tab packages uh, in, uh, in RStudio and just click on install and then um, install the, the packages you need and you can separate multiple packages by space or comma. And once you have all the packages installed then you, you can just click on uh, on the name of the package and then uh, uh, RStudio will actually load it for you. So okay, before the computer decided to just reboot, uh, we, were, we were talking about uh, differences between uh, having access to the, the full uh, population uh, and uh, having access to just um, uh, a sample of, uh, of data. And clearly, again, what you need to do is to design an experiment that will uh, guarantee that all the, the conclusion you can draw from the experiment can be extended to the general population. And um, for example, the, the way you compare different groups is, again, comparing their mean values and their uh, standard error, so that the confidence interval around the mean value. Uh, and this will allow you to uh, compare groups not just in terms of the, the average value but also in terms of uh, uh, the natu their, their natural variation because clearly there is natural variation um, involved in all the experiments with environmental data. Uh, so what I did here is actually create uh, a, a little simulation. So for example in this case I'm creating two samples so uh, sample S1 and sample S2 so again, uh, as, as we saw yesterday, I'm using the function rnorm, and the function rnorm simply creates a, a vector of numbers um, drawn fra from a, a, a particular uh, normal distribution. So in this case, I'm creating two samples with three observations each uh, coming from exactly the same population. So that the population has a mean of 5 and the standard deviation of 2.5. So if we, if we just click on the, on the bar and we submit these two lines, uh, all right, wait. Okay, so basically um, we know exactly that these two samples come from the same, the same population because we uh, we decided ourselves that the, the population has a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 2.5. Okay, so the, the, the we assume that the population has a normal distribution because in inferential statistics, most of the tests we use, uh, from the t-test to the ANOVA to the linear regression, they all assume that the data are normally distributed. So in this case, we are sampling a normal distribution exactly the same normal distribution, but, but we are creating two different samples. We can look at the mean uh, of these two samples by using the function mean. So as you can see from the results, even though we know exactly what is the mean value of the population, the mean value of the two samples look very different. And clearly this will change every time you run the analysis again, because the, the function R norm is, uh, is just sampling randomly from the two distributions. But in this case, we can see that the two values are actually quite different. Uh, one is, is around 8 and the other is 5.5. So now, uh, as we saw yesterday, one simple way to compare mean values uh, or comparing two different samples is by using their confidence interval. So we can use once again the function SEM, which we created yesterday to compute the standard error of the mean. And then we can create a data frame with the two confidence intervals. So in this case, we are creating a data frame with three columns. The first is, is called lower 95. And in this case, we, we are just um, creating the, using the vector with the, the um, 
the confidence interval, the, the lower bound of the, of the confidence interval for the two mean values, and then we have the two mean values, and then the upper bounds of the confidence interval. So again, we, you can see that clearly the two, uh, the two mean values are different, but if you check the, the lower and upper uh, bounds of the, of the confidence interval, they are actually overlapping. So again, if, we, if you imagine creating a bar, a bar chart like we did yesterday, uh, even though the, the two values are different, the, the, the confidence interval, so the error bar, we actually overlap. So in that case, we have a, a, um, uh, this is a simple way of, of uh, concluding that those two uh, mean values could come from the same population. So the two samples, even though they may look different, they are probably coming from the same distribution. Uh, so, um, and this is exactly what we are trying to, to achieve with, uh, with the formal test. We are trying to decide whether two samples, even though they may look different, they come or not from the same population. Because when you do a formal test, so let's say you, do a, 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 you want to do a t-test using these two samples. The t-test will uh, look at uh, what is called the, um, uh, the null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis will assume that the two mean values are the same. So the two, the two samples are coming from the same population. And it's comparing this with the, the alternative hypothesis, which simply says that the two samples come from two different populations. So the two mean values are actually uh, statistically different. So now we can look at the uh, at new uh, sample. So now in this case, we are creating sample S3, again, using the, 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 the same function. A again, this is a, a simulation. So we know exactly uh, what is the, the uh, normal distribution that generated this sample. And in this case, we are again uh, creating a sample of three observations, but they are coming from a different uh, uh, normal uh, distribution. In this case, the, the mean value of the new normal distribution is 6.25, which is actually, in, in standard deviation terms, uh, is uh, um, around one standard deviation away from the previous mean values. So again, if you, if you imagine having access to the same, the, the, the whole population of values, uh, you will see quite large differences between, between the two populations. So if you imagine plotting the, the two histogram, uh, one standard deviation away, will, 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 um, it, will, it will be quite, uh, quite simple to, to, to see those differences. And also in the field, if you, have, uh, uh, if you imagine having, having two plots and uh, having this sort of, of, of average differences, it will be uh, it would be quite simple to actually show this different with, with the naked eye. So again, we can, in this case, we are uh, again drawing uh, and creating a, a, a small sample from, uh, from this new population, and again plotting uh, not just the, the mean value, but also the, the, the confidence interval around those two means. So again, if you, if you see the, the two confidence intervals, uh, the, the confidence interval are, are actually overlapping. I mean, the, the upper bound is more or less the same. The mean values of S1 and S3, so our two samples, are, are very similar. And uh, this will, uh, because we have uh, similar mean values uh, and the two, in, um, the two confidence intervals are overlapping, again, in this case, we will conclude that the two uh, samples come from the same population. However, this, because we know uh, what we actually sample for, we, we know that this is not true. Uh, so this is what we call uh, a, a false negative result, because clearly we, we know exactly that the, the, the two populations are, are different, but uh, our experiments, so our, our two samples, are not uh, enough to actually pick up these differences. So in this case, we, in, in statistical terms, we, we say that the, the experiment was not powerful enough to actually detect the, the, the differences in the two populations. So our experiment was not, uh, not powerful enough, so it didn't have the enough samples to be able to uh, detect the difference of one standard deviation. Uh, and the same actually uh, is true for um, false positives, so that there may be experiments in which you 
uh, accept the alternative hypothesis uh, when, when actually it's not true. So you, you because clearly uh, there is an amount of randomness in what we do, uh, and in some cases you may you may reject uh, the null hypothesis. So you can say you, you, you will say okay these two groups uh, are statistically different, but actually they are not, and this is called a, fal a false positive outcome. Uh, in uh, when we design experiment, we need to take into account both. Uh, uh, the false positive rate and the false negative rate. And the way we do that is to set uh, values for both the alpha, so the significance of the test, and beta, which is the power of the experiment. Generally, uh, we accept a significance, so an alpha of 5%, uh, which is the p-value, so 0 0.05. And in that case, uh, we are accepting that uh, uh, we may encounter um, this, this type 1 error 5% of the time, so, which is the, 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 false, the false positive error. And in terms of beta, so the power of the experiment, again, based on literature, we, we generally accept a power of 80%, which means that in 20% of the time we may uh, end up with false negative results. And these are all... Uh, um, these are all features that, that, uh, that you need to consider when you are planning an experiment. Because clearly, when you do a, a power analysis, you need to say exactly what is the, the, the alpha level and the beta level that you are, you are willing to accept. Because this will, will drive the number of samples you actually need for your experiment to, to be robust. And in terms of... Uh, um, of planning the actual experiment, there are, there are three basic principles that you need to follow. So the first principle is, is randomization. So every time you run an experiment, you need to, to, to be sure of randomize everything you do in the field. And this is particularly important to minimize as much as you can the natural variation uh, of, of the experiment. So for example, let's say you, you run an experiment in a field or you run an experiment with different animals. Uh, you need to, to randomize, for example, uh, uh, within species or for different soil types. Because if you don't randomize uh, and you, you place a series of, of samples in the, in the same part of the field, and for some reason that part of the field is, uh, has, has more moisture or it's more fertile than, than the rest of the field, then clearly your result will be will be biased. So randomization is, uh, is the first uh, and probably most important uh, um, uh, requirement for, uh, uh, for, for good experiment. The second one I is blocking. And again, this is very, very much dependent on randomization. Blocking is something that you can use to control for sources of variation that you know exist. So again, for example, if you are in the field and you know that a particular part of the field is, uh, has, has more moisture, or as a different soil type, then you can block this part of the field and, and do a sort of sub-experiment in that particular part of the field. Uh, if you're working with animals and you know that a particular species uh, have, uh, has different uh, way of, uh, for example, uh, um, you know, uh, getting uh, fat out of the diet, then you can, you can use blocking to control for the source of variation. But then clearly blocking is used for uh, Sources of variation that you know about, and most of the time uh, there are some uh, some sources of variation that are difficult to control because maybe you don't have enough data, or uh, or or, or, or simply you, you you don't have a way to control for for the other sources of variation. So clearly, I mean, uh, genetic variation are very difficult to control. So in in that case, the only thing you can do. Uh, to be able to have a robust experiment, because clearly every time you have an additional source of variation, what, what it does in, in statistical term is increase the standard deviation of your population. So instead of uh, narrowing down the effect and focusing on the effects you actually want to, to detect, uh, because you have this additional source of variation, uh, you are actually increasing the spread around the mean value of your population. And in that case, the only thing you can do is increase replication. Because clearly, we, are not, we don't really care about the standard deviation of the population. The only thing we care is, is the standard error of the mean. 
And as, as we saw yesterday, the standard error of the mean is dependent on the, on the number of samples. So the more samples you have, the, the, the larger the sample size, the lower the standard error, and the more robust will be your experiment. OK, so as you probably are aware, there are a series of, of experimental designs that you can use in, uh, in either fields or, or animal experiment or, or other experiment you, you do. The, let, let's say the two most important ones are the complete randomized design and the block design. Um, clearly, the, the, the block design is used particularly when, again, you know that there are sources of variation you want to control for. So uh, you know that a particular uh, uh, species of animal needs to be treated differently, or you know a particular area in the field needs to be treated different. So in that case, you are using blocking. Uh, but you need to be sure that you're using blocking for a reason. You don't just block for the sake of it, but you block because you know that there's, there's a reason for actually blocking it. Otherwise, uh, uh, one of the simplest form of, uh, of, of experimental design is the complete randomized design, which just basically uh, randomize uh, your entire treatment structure uh, over the whole area of, or the, the, the whole subject you have. <coughs> so let, let's start with, uh, with the basic one, so the complete randomized design. So again, there are a series of functions in, uh, in the package agricola that you can use. Um, so the, the, the first function uh, we, we are going to use is design.crd. So all the, the function to design experiment, they have the same form. So it's design dot something. And then you get uh, the, the acronym of, uh, uh, of the experimental design. So in this case, it's CRD for complete randomized design. And we will see all the other, the other form later on. So let me just um, add the, the two packages, because I'm not sure whether I, I, I included after the computer booted up again. Um, all right, so uh, the, the syntax uh, to use the function within the package agricola is, is very similar across all the functions. So you have the option TRT, uh, which takes your, your treatment structure, and the R for the number of replicates. So let's say in this case, we just want to have three replicates. And the treatment, uh, so the, the, the object uh, you use for the option TRT is always a vector. And it's a vector of strings in this case. So uh, for example, th with this line, as you can see, we are using the function C to create a vector. And the vector is a vector of strings. So we have a string A, a string B, and a control. So in this case, we are just using a, a very simple treatment structure. So uh, it's just a. a, a, a uh, so we have two treatments, treatment A and treatment B, and plus we have our control. And again, treatment A and B could be different level of nitrogen or, or, or other stuff. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but this, it, this is a good way to actually um, uh, be able to design the experiment in a way that becomes uh, uh, clear what you need to do in the field. And I'll show you what I mean later. So first of all, we, uh, we load, we create this uh, uh, object treatment. We can actually see what uh, uh, what treatment looks like by just just uh, repeating it. So again, this is a simple vector with a, b, and control, and and these are strings. You know that they are strings because they are within quotation marks. So now we can just use the treatment uh, within the function design CRD, and this will create a. Um, um, uh, a, a complete randomized design. So now we can, we can again, we can run this other uh, line, and uh, in, in the control, it will show what uh, um, how the, the object CRD looks like. So again, there are a series of parameters. Uh, it says that the design is a complete randomized design. It says a, a series of other stuff. What we are really interested in is the, the last part, so the, the what is called the book. And uh, I think I can, uh, yeah, if we run just this line, so we are just extracting uh, the, the part of the object called book. And basically, in, in this case, R has created um, 
uh, a structure that you can use in the field. So for example, let's say that uh, uh, you are dividing your, your field uh, in uh, a series of subplots. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the randomization has already taken place within the function, so you know exactly which treatment goes in which plot. So if you have uh, uh, plotting set out in, in the field, then you know exactly that in plot one it goes treatment A, plot two it treatment B. So in this case, the randomization has already happened uh, within the, the function. So, so the function takes uh, care of, uh, of the randomization <coughs> and it will, it will create an object that you can use in the field, for example, to, to plot your experiment. So as I mentioned, the, the, the one of the issues with, with the package agricola is that uh, in, in uh, the option TRT, the only thing you can input uh, is a vector. So if you have uh, more complex experiments, because clearly in, in this case we just add uh, two treatments and a control, so if we are talking about a formal test, this would be a simple one-way ANOVA. Again, we will, we will see what the one-way ANOVA is to, tomorrow, uh, but because we just have uh, this, this very simple treatment structure, it would be a, a simple one-way ANOVA. However, in, in most cases, when, we, when we, we do experiments in the field, we are not just interested in comparing two treatments, we are interested in comparing maybe different treatments. So let's say we have uh, uh, treatment A, B, and C plus additional levels. So let's say it's uh, uh, variety A, B, and C with uh, two different nitrogen level and uh, two different seed rates. In that case, we need to, first of all, before we can apply the function design.crd, we need to work on creating uh, a vector with all the, 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 the treatments we need. So in this case, what, what I'm doing in, uh, in this line is just creating t three different uh, um, vector. So again, vector of strings with uh, treatment A, B, and C, one and two, and then plus and minus. Well, again, it, it may be uh, the seed rate or whatever. I mean, it doesn't really matter what this, uh, uh, these labels are as long as you know what, uh, what uh, they stand for. And then what we can do is we can use the function supply to merge together uh, this, uh, this, these two objects. So again, you don't really, for the time being, you don't really need to understand everything that is going on with this code because clearly it's, uh, generally speaking, it's a bit more complex compared to what, what you normally do. Uh, experimental design will not be included in the assignment, so uh, all this, this line will not be used. But then again, if you are using, uh, you, if you are using these lines for, uh, for plotting your experiment for your master thesis or whatever, you can just copy and paste different labels in this function and the code will still work. Okay, so in this case, what we are, what we are basically doing in this first line, we are iterating through the object TRT1, which is the first vector, and we are pasting all the elements of the second vector, TRT2. So I can just, if I just copy and paste this line into a new R script, so then we can look at it more in detail. So for example, if I just run this part of the code, you see what, what, it, what this line did is just paste one and two within each element of the first vector. So what we obtain is a new vector with more elements compared to, to the, the, the first and second. So the element would be uh, the, the element in the, the first vector times the element in the second vector with additional uh, treatments. So in this case, uh, we have a treatment A1 and A2, treatment B1 and B2, etc. And then if I do the same with the, the second vector, again, I'm doing the same thing, but uh, I'm using uh, the, let's say, the, the temporary object, so the object trt.tmp, which is a temporary object, the object we, we just saw with A1 and A2, and then pasting on top of it levels from the other vector. So again, what, what I'm obtaining now is, um, the, the, let's say the final treatment form. So every time we have the level, uh, the level A1 plus, A1 minus, A2 plus, A2 minus, etc. However, to complicate things further, uh, in this exp particular experiment, we, we also want to add control. 
So clearly control does not really take uh, all the other factors into account. So you don't have control one plus because control is just control. You, you are not placing any additional element in that particular subplot. So in that case, you just need to um, include additional level to the final vector. So the final vector we created is called TRT, which is this object here. And in this case, we are simply creating a vector of uh, composed of all the elements within TRT. So all the elements that you see here, plus control repeated twice. So again, the, the, you have the function rep, which stands for repeat. And in this case, I'm just saying repeat the, the string control two times. Again, this is the number of times. So in this case, if I just run this line, I'm, and again, I'm sort of pasting the old vector, and then I'm including two controls at the end. Again, I know that uh, it, it may seem a bit complicated, because clearly there, there are a lot of different sub-functions within this call, uh, and, and, and clearly this is, this is advanced coding. Uh, but again, you don't really need to understand everything that is going on for the time being in this particular chunk of code. Uh, you just need to know that the package agricole can be used to actually uh, perform or, or plan uh, complex experiments in the field. So you can do it if you want. And then once we have uh, the, the final vector, so once we have this, uh, um, this code, so once we have the, the, the full vector with all the, the, the levels, then we can input uh, uh, this vector in the function design CRD. And uh, it will create a, a much more complex design. So for, again, we are using three replicas. But clearly, now we are replicating the, the, all the, the, the treatment structure, so the entire treatment structure, three times. So in this case, we have 42 rows. And again, these are all randomized. So you know exactly that in plot one, you can have uh, uh, your treatment A1 plus. And for whatever it means, in, in, in plot 2 is C2 mi minus. So everything is randomized within, uh, within this function. So you can just take this, this book object, print it out, and take it in the field or, uh, um, and, and, and plan your experiment. OK. So now that we have already our, uh, our um, treatment structure, which is the object TRT control, let me run this once again to make sure that the object TRT control is, is what, what we need. Uh, I mean, once you have this object with all the treatment structure, so the, the, the entirety of your treatment structure, you can use it with whatever function you want within uh, the series of functions in the Agricola package, because they all the, the, the syntax is exactly the same. So again, if you want to do a complete block design, you can just use a, a different function. So in this case, it's design.rcbd, which stands for randomized complete block design. But the syntax within the function is exactly the same. So you have the option trt, which takes a vector of strings, and then r, which stands for the random replicates. So again, you, you, you just need to, to run this line, and then you will, uh, you, will get, uh, uh, you will get a sketch. So in this case, you will, you will see the three blocks. So each uh, row of this matrix will, 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 uh, will be one of the blocks you, are, you will actually use in, in the fields to plan your experiment. So uh, these two, so the, the, the um, randomized complete design and the, the um, block design are, let's say, the, the, the major one. So probably 80% of the time, uh, if you want to plan an experiment, you, you use those two. However, there are other uh, experimental design that may be useful in certain occasions. So one of these design is the uh, incomplete block design. Uh, in this case, it is it's mostly used when you have maybe unbalanced designs, uh, or sometimes uh, it's used because you have uh, particular constraints in the field, so you don't have enough uh, subplots, uh, and you want to use uh, uh, this sort of, of incomplete design. Um, I mean, again, the, the, the way of doing it uh, is very simple. So again, you, you just need to. Uh, as we saw before, create your, your treatment structure. So again, you, you need input the, 
the two vectors with the labels uh, and then uh, all the function to merge the, the vector together. I mean, clearly, you, you could, if you want, you could create uh, your vector manually. So you can start typing uh, uh, within quotation mark A1, uh, A2, whatever. I mean, this is just a way to actually auto automate the whole process. But if, if, you, if you don't want to use it and, and you want to do it manually, I mean, by all means, you can, you can do it. Um, so again, in, in the complete, uh, in the um, incomplete block design, um, there are a bit more. Um, th there is one more option you need to, to provide. So the option K. You can actually look at uh, at the help page if you want to learn more about it. So basically, as I said, the, 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 the general structure, the general syntax of all the function within uh, uh, the Agricola is uh, option TRT for the treatment structure and R for the, the replication. However, in this case, you also need to provide the, 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 the size of each block. Because clearly, the, the, the number of, uh, of, uh, of treatments you have uh, is not balanced. So the, the number of blocks uh, will, will need to, the, the, the function will need to know how many elements to include within each block. And this can be done with, uh, with the option K. And then again, uh, it, will, uh, it, it will create a sketch that you can use in, in the field to actually plan your experiment. Another design that, uh, yeah, it was popular some time ago, but now, now it's generally not, not, not really used, is the split plot. Uh, so I have an image of a split plot design. So basically, the split plots is, is used when you have uh, treatments uh, that needs to have uh, a certain area. So let's say you have, uh, um, um, you want to compare uh, a certain uh, fertilizer or a certain pesticides. Um, clearly, the, 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 the pesticide needs to have a particular area. I mean, you cannot really apply a pesticide of, on, on a very small area. So you, you apply the pesticide on what we call the, the, the whole plot, which is a larger area within your, your experimental design. And then you have subplots. So subplots, uh, they, they may take uh, different factors. So in, the, in this case, it may be, I don't know, the seed rate or, uh, or, or other, again, other treatments. But the, the, um, the, the general idea is that uh, the, the, you, the, the treatments you want to apply have uh, different uh, 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 application area, so you need to, to have uh, you, you have constraints about uh, about the area of uh, of, uh, of treatment. So you need to create uh, this sort of nested designs, uh, and clearly the, the the fact that you have uh, this sort of nested design, uh, it needs to be taken into account when you design the experiment and also when when you do the uh, the analysis. Uh, we clearly we will see the analysis uh, tomorrow. Uh, for the time being, we, get, we can just use the, the function design split to create the split plot. In this case, the, the, um, the syntax is a bit different uh, because it, it, uh, it takes not just one treatment structure, but two treatment structure. And then, again, it depends on the whole plot and the, sp the subplot. Again, you can actually copy and paste and see um, what, what is the, the, the meaning of uh, of TRT1 and TRT2. So again, the first one would be the treatments for the, the plots. So in, in, in the image, we saw the, the whole plots. Um, so the, the first level of treatments. And then the second one would be the treatment in the subplot. And then again, you have, uh, you have book, so then you know exactly what to put in, uh, in, in each of, the, of, your, uh, of your plots and subplots. Another popular uh, um, experimental design, which again is not is not much used, to be honest. I mean, uh, I, I probably encountered it a couple of times, uh, but it's, it, it it could be quite useful. Is the is what is called the strip plot design, uh, and basically here instead of uh, of creating, uh, uh, let's say, um, rectangular plot, you create uh, all strips with in, in the field with the same treatment. Uh, and this is clearly, uh, I mean, it, it has an application. So for example, when you're working with uh, commercial partners, uh, commercial partners, they may not have the equipment uh, to run experiment on, on small plots. 
so it may be easier for them to run, for example, apply the one single treatment to a, a, a whole strip of land. Uh, and in, the, in this case, what you, you just need to do is, if you want to, for example, compare two different treatments, you just run one uh, and you cover a whole strip, and then the other you cover a strip in, uh, uh, in perpendicularly to, to what you, the direction you used uh, the first time. And this is called the strip plot design. Again, um, it's, not, it's not particularly common, but uh, uh, if you're working with, with, um, with commercial partners, uh, it, it may be that, uh, uh, that they are used to this sort of, of experimental design. Um, for, uh, as, as far as the, the, the coding goes, again, you have uh, two, two different uh, options for treatment one and treatment two. And uh, the rest is exactly the same as you've you, you done before. So again, uh, you have your, your st treatment structure, so you know exactly what, again, in this case, you have, you have two different treatments. So you know exactly what is the combination in uh, each one of uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, subplots. Uh, so uh, if, if you run uh, with, uh, with um, one treatment on, on one strip and the other one on uh, perpendicular, then you will obtain two, uh, a combination of two, uh, two treatments within each, uh, each subsection. Finally, uh, in terms of experimental design, um, um, this is actually very popular. It's, it's called the Latin square design. This is very popular with, for, for animal experiments uh, because this is a, what we call a, a within subject design. Uh, so basically, for example, if you, have, uh, if you want to uh, compare uh, uh, different diets on, on cows, let's say, um, most of the time what you want to do is reduce as, mu as much as possible the number of, of subjects, so the number of, element, uh, of animals you include in, in the experiment. Uh, this is normally done for, for ethics uh, and uh, because uh, clearly you, you, you don't want to, to have, uh, and, and, and normally you don't have, have, have access to all these animals, so you want to reduce the number of subjects. Uh, so we, what you can do is use a within subject design. So for example, in this case, you will, uh, you will test two, the, let's say you, you want to compare two different diets, you will, you will test the two diets uh, for, in each, for each of the same animals. So the, the, the same cow will take diet one in, uh, uh, in, 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 in time one, and then it will, uh, it will go to uh, a period with the normal diet, and then it will, it will take uh, uh, diet number two. So the same subject will get both treatment, which is di completely different to what we saw uh, up to now. Because up to now, when you have uh, a subplot, that particular subplot just take one treatment or a combination of treatment, but it doesn't really take all the treatment. In Latin square, because it's a within subject design, all the subject will get uh, all treatments uh, at different times. So the, the challenge here is to design the experiment in a way that uh, uh, the treatment can be spread uh, evenly uh, for all the, the, the subject. And again, uh, in terms of coding, uh, it's, it's extremely simple. There's, uh, there's a function design.lsd, you just um, include the treatment structure and you just run it. And then in this case, it, we, we have a, a, what is called a 6 by 6 Latin square, uh, and each row is one subject. So, for example, subject 1 will take uh, um, treatment B1, and then uh, probably we'll have a, a crossover period or, or a period with, uh, let's say, the normal uh, treatment or the normal diet, and then we take treatment A2, and then treatment B2, etc., uh, until all the treatments are, are used for each of the subjects. Okay, so the last thing I want to, to show you in, uh, in uh, in this lecture is the t-test. So as I said, the t-test is the, the first form of uh, formal uh, testing that you can do on, on your data. Uh, is uh, probably one of the simplest uh, form of uh, inferential statistics. And basically, the aim of the t-test is exactly what we do before uh, by just by uh, looking at the confidence interval. So basically, the t-test, what, what it does is comparing two samples and uh, calculating uh, the p-value. So the p-value will tell you what is the, uh, what are the probability 
of these two, two samples being uh, be different. Uh, so what, what is the probability that the two samples come from two different populations, which is exactly what you need to test when you do, uh, when you do inferential statistics. Uh, in terms of syntax, uh, performing a t-test in R is, is very simple. Uh, you just use the function t.test, and then you include your two samples. So include, uh, in, uh, again, in, in R term, you include two numerical vectors, uh, and then you, you provide an alternative hypothesis. So as, as we saw before, uh, each of these uh, inferential statistical tests will start from a null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, we know exactly what it is, and the null hypothesis says that, uh, in this case, our two samples come from the same population. But we also want to have an alternative hypothesis. Uh, generally, um, the alternative hypothesis for t-test is the two-sided. So we just want to know if those two samples are different, so they are coming from two different populations. Uh, alternative, uh, other alternative hypotheses are uh, greater or lower. So in that case, you want to test whether maybe sample 2 as, uh, or population 2 is uh, as a, a larger mean compared to, uh, to population 1. But most of the time, you just need to, to, to see if they are different. And, and then you can work out what is the, the highest uh, by looking at the samples. So again, we can, uh, uh, we can use the, the two uh, samples we created using our, uh, our simulation. Uh, so again, uh, uh, if you remember, we had uh, sample one uh, with uh, uh, three observation coming from a population with uh, a mean of five and a standard deviation of 2.5, and then we have sample we had sample three uh, again with three observation uh, coming from a population with a standard deviation of 6.25. So again, there is a large difference between these two population, but in terms of samples, uh, we didn't really see any difference. So now, because we, we already have an hypothesis, so we, our hypothesis is that the two samples, uh, because the, the two uh, uh, confidence intervals are overlapping, our hypothesis is that they come from the same population. So we are expecting uh, that uh, the, 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 the p-value will not be significant. So the p-value, we are expecting a p-value higher than 5%. And actually, uh, when we, we run the experiment, uh, the p-value is uh, 0.59. So in that case, uh, normally, uh, we accept a significant level of 5%. So we, we accept a, only a p-value which is equal or, or lower than 0.05. In this case, we need to uh, reject the, the alternative hypothesis and accept the, the null hypothesis. So we we need to conclude that uh, our two samples are not, uh, uh, are not different. However, because we, cr we, we run the simulation, we know that uh, actually that's not true. That's a false, a false negative result, because we know that the, the, the two populations are actually different. Uh, so what is the problem with, the, with this ex experiment? The problem is power. Uh, so the, the, the real issue is that we only had three observations for each of the two samples. So the power of this experiment was not enough to detect this amount of difference between, between groups. So we, what we can do is uh, um, using uh, calculating what we call the, the effect size. So the effect size, uh, um, and uh, we have uh, actually the, the um, the equation to calculate the effect size uh, here. So the effect size is basically uh, the, the core of uh, a power analysis. Uh, and the effect size will, uh, will measure the standardized differences between the mean values you have in your samples. So it will tell you what is the average difference between uh, your, your, your two uh, groups. And again, um, these are the two equations you, you use for calculating the effect size. And this particular type of effect size is referred to as uh, the Cohen's D, because Cohen is the, the first uh, author that suggested these uh, um, this, this equations to calculate the effect size. Again, you don't really need to, um, to know exactly how to, to compute it, because I, 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 um, I, I wrote the code to actually compute uh, 
the, the effect size here. And again, if you want to, to use it for your own data, you just need to uh, change S3 and S1 with uh, the, the name of the object you have uh, for, for your samples. So let's say that we want to, to calculate the effect size. So in, uh, in terms of uh, statistical meaning, the effect size measures uh, the, the difference in, in terms of standard deviation between your mean values. So I don't know if you remember, but we, we created the second sample from a population which had a, 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 a difference of one standard deviation. Okay? Uh, so we know that uh, the, the effect size should be one because the difference between the, the mean of the first population and the mean of the second population is one standard deviation. However, when we calculate the effect size, and again, this depends on, on your particular simulation because clearly this, uh, this will change every time you run this code, uh, but the effect size is uh, uh, 0 0.47, which suggests that uh, the two mean value of the sample are separated by more or less half a standard deviation. So this effect size we calculate is actually conservative because uh, uh, the, we are assuming uh, that the, the real differences are much lower compared to what, uh, what we use for our simulation. However, what we can do is use uh, this effect size, uh, so the experimental effect size we calculated from our data to perform a power analysis. And the power analysis will tell us exactly how many samples we would need to uh, design an experiment capable of detecting this amount of change in our data. And the way we can do that is to use the function uh, power t-test. Again, this is uh, a function that's available within the package power, so pwr. In this uh, function, we need to input a series of uh, uh, of data. So the, the first, uh, and again, we can take a look at the L page if we want to learn more about this. So basically, we have uh, a series of, uh, uh, of information we can input. So for example, we have the number of samples, the effect size, the significance level, the power, type, and alternative. And uh, depending on what we need the function to, uh, to output, we set one of these uh, uh, parameters to null. So for example, uh, as you can see in this function, I don't, I don't have uh, the option n. The option n is the number of samples, and the number of samples is actually what we need to, the function to, to compute. So we are, we are not including this option, we are setting it to null, because we want the function to compute the number of samples. So n is, is what we, we need the function to output. And then for, for all the other, um, for all the other option, we have everything. So for the option D, the effect size, we just calculate it because as you said here, the effect size is, is the Cohen's D. So the, 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 the object ES, we just calculated. The significant levels is, is alpha. So again, we know from literature that uh, we need to design experiment with at least 5% of significant, of significance. So in this case, uh, the significant level is 0.05. Uh, the power, again, we know from literature that we are happy to accept a power of at least 80%. Uh, so in this case, we input a power of 0 0.8. And then the type and the alternative is the same as the, the t-test we want to run. So in this case, it's the, it's the two samples. So we just want to see if there are differences between the groups. And w if we run this function, then we will, s we will, we will get a, a, a number of... Uh, uh, of uh, a number n, which is the number of samples per group. So again, this is, the, the, this is very important. n is the number of sample for each group. So uh, now we know exactly that if we want to detect the effect um, that we calculated from an, our data, so we want to calculate, uh, to design an experiment capable of detecting uh, an average effect of uh, alpha standard deviation different between mean values, we would need at least 72 samples per group, okay? So clearly the, 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 the sample we created before, because they, they had just three observations per group, they were not nearly enough to be able to detect this difference. So now we can, what we can do is, uh, um, and, and again, usually you, you round 
uh, this number uh, to the, the, the highest um, the highest, uh, the highest possible number, so that, that's why I use the function ceiling, uh, so that the, 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 the number of samples will be 72, not nev never uh, 71. And then we can uh, repeat the experiment. So again, we, we can again uh, simulate the extraction of other samples from the same two populations. So again, we, we run uh, this basically the same simulation we ran before. So again, two population, the first with the mean value of 5 and standard deviation of 2.5, the second with the mean value of 6.25 and the same standard deviation. However, in this case, we are not uh, included tr just three samples, but we are included 72 samples each for, each, uh, uh, for each vector. So we are creating two vectors of 72 elements each. If, if we run the t-test again, then you will see that the p-value now is extremely low. Uh, and clearly this experiment is conservative because uh, despite the fact that we know that the, the real differences between the two populations was one standard deviation, we power the experiment to be able to detect half a standard deviation. So clearly we, we, we had the more, a lot more uh, samples compared to, to what we actually needed. However, this is, th this is uh, exactly what you do uh, when you need to plan experiments in the field. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, guidance for, for planning experiments, uh, according to the literature, um, if you want to plan experiment and you, you don't really know uh, what is the, the, the observed effect size for your data, you can use a, a, a general effect size, a medium effect size. So 50%, 0 0.5 should be a good, a good value of, uh, of effect size to use for what is called the a priori power experiment, uh, power analysis. Okay? However, uh, sometimes, uh, because you, you don't really know what to expect, it is suggested to run a, a, what is called a pilot study. So you, run, you just run your, your study with uh, a uh, few subjects just to have an idea of what would be the, the average differences between treatments uh, and then you, you calculate the effect size in the, the same exact way we, we, we saw in this experiment. Uh, you know what is uh, what the observed or experimental effect size is and then you, you input this value uh, to, to perform the power analysis and then you know exactly what you need to, to use uh, to have a, a robust experiment.